I have a quick question, just hear me out. Is Goat Simulator a revolutionary game? Let's take a look. Let's face it, if we're totally honest, compared to other mediums like film or TV, games really struggle with making us laugh, at least intentionally. A lot of things that I find funny are errors or mistakes. So like glitches in The Sims, you know, the indecent ones, those are pretty funny. Or people doing things that they're not supposed to do, like wiggling for your captors in DayZ which is creepy. Sure, there have been a handful of intentionally funny games, and frankly, I don't think there have been enough. I mean, there's Full Throttle. I, uh, fixed your door. Conquer's Fur Day. I'm a f paint pot. Or more recently, Jazz Punk. This is my Mima's secret pigeon pot pie recipe. Please wait while they bake. These games are hilarious and amazing, but I don't think they're necessarily funny in a way that's unique to games. They're more akin to Arrested Development or Louis C.K. in that the game's writers or designers are the ones writing and telling the jokes. You just sit back and relax. I shall now teach you a French kissing. To me, at least, there really hasn't been a precedent for interactive humor that completely relies on the player and the player alone. At least until... Now, on April Fool's Day of this year, Coffee Stain Studios released a title called Goat Simulator. And let's just start with the obvious. Goat Simulator is a game about goats. Yeah. No relation to Game of Goats. Although there are a lot of similarities, namely, you know, bleeding. Goat Simulator lets you do things with goats that you should never do in real life. Your goat wears a jetpack. Your goat also bungee jumps from a hang glider using its tongue. Your goat drags another goat up a ladder, also using its tongue, as it turns out. And as you might expect, Goat Simulator is hilarious. There are tons of Let's Play videos that are a testament to this fact. The peculiar thing about Goat Simulator, though, is that there's no real objective. It's like the Seinfeld of goat video games. It's about nothing. <laughs> it exists solely for the purpose of humor and to make you laugh at the crazy, crazy goat antics. And that makes a lot of sense. It was developed as a joke prototype as part of an internal company game jam. So here's what I'm wondering. Is it possible for a game that started as a joke and is principally about goats? Could that be a revolution for comedy and games? And maybe for comedy in general? You're probably wondering, Jamin, what are you talking about? There are tons of funny games. In fact, there are a bunch coming out this year. And this is true, but most of them are funny in a way that's kind of different from Goat Simulator. One of the chief ways that games are funny is through dialogue or through cut sequences. For instance, there would be nothing really funny about Portal if GLaDOS wasn't trying to lure you to your death with Black Forest cake. Three slash four cup butter or margarine. Another way that games are funny is through their narrative. So that would include self-referentially humorous games like South Park, The Stick of Truth. You cannot escape the scientific certainty of global climate change. Yeah! And Breath of Death 7. I'm liking the sense of humor, I have to say. <laughs> then there's also games that put you in absurd, outlandish, and unexpected situations, like Soda Drinker Pro and Octodad, the deadliest catch. Oh, people are watching. Oh. Oh no! No! All these games are amazing and hilarious, but there's really something important that's worth noting. It's the game designer who's telling the jokes, not the player. Leisure Suit Larry creator Al Lowe says that being a funny adventure game writer is kind of like being a director. In an interview with Killscreen, he said that all of the games that he made were a reflection of his personality. Plus, for all these games, there's a progression. So one of my personal favorite funny games, The Simpsons, has a lot of jokes in it. But in theory, the jokes could be really, really not funny. I mean, you could still play and complete the game, and I think it probably would be fun, albeit in less humorous form. So what is it that makes Goat Simulator so radically different from some of its peers? Well, the big thing is that it doesn't lean on a lot of the traditional devices that you've seen in other games to make you laugh. Specifically, nothing is scripted. Oh, the truck. Here we go! Whoa. Ghost Simulator has no prepackaged jokes, there's no cut sequences, there is no overarching comedic narrative. You won't find a walkthrough on Game Facts because there's nothing to walk through. Goat Simulator just says, here's your goat, and here's your world, go be funny. The comedy emerges from what you as the player decide that you want to do. So if you want to take a jetpack and put on a goat and fly into a gas station, go right ahead. <laughs> Or you can become king of the goats. Go into my hidden castle, meet my army of goats, and sit 
on the throne. It uses comedic methods that are ultimately unique to games and develops emergent comedy. For instance, the game's lead designer, Armin Iprasajic, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, he said that they left glitches deliberately in the game. So the ragdoll physics, for example, are kind of wonky. If you cause a car crash and it hits somebody and then they end up with a wildly overextended neck, that's just gonna happen, and it's totally funny. And yes, the game does have a point system, but its only purpose is to prod you towards the ever more ridiculous, like doing endless flips in a room full of air ventilators. And I, I will ostrich you. So you're probably wondering, well, what about Grand Theft Auto? That seems to allow for many open-ended possibilities for humor, and that's true, there are a lot of funny things that happen in GTA, but that's not the point of Grand Theft Auto. I mean, there's still missions and other stuff to do. And another important thing is that you can die in Grand Theft Auto. In Goat Simulator, you're totally immortal. Your only purpose of existence, so to speak, is comedic performance. Look, there's no perfect theory of comedy, because come on, explaining jokes makes them terrible and unfunny. But in psychology, there is something that's called the benign violation theory. It postulates that the reason that things are funny is because they're both safe, but also threatening. Running your fearless goat into a bus headlong and then watching it careen across the pavement only to emerge from the incident totally unscathed, that's the definition of the benign violation theory. And absurd stunts like that make you the comedian through the mechanics of play. This is a really, really big deal because before someone told you jokes and then you laughed at them or maybe you didn't. Is that the cat up there? We're getting licked. In this case, you're the one telling the jokes and you're laughing at the jokes that you just told. You're the comedian and the audience. Fat goat, no! 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 How's that different from a game like Cards Against Humanity, which also has people deploying jokes for comedic timing? Well, the big difference is that you don't write the things on the cards. Someone else does. In Goat Simulator, you're developing your own comedic routines from scratch. Even a game like Quap, which has a lot of slapstick elements and is really, really funny, its humor stems from the fact that it's so difficult. And its difficulty lies in the fact that there's an objective at the end. You're trying to get to that sandpit. So maybe something as silly as Goat Simulator shows how games can be a vehicle for participatory comedy and help us explore laughter in new ways. And that's because becoming more important than ever, especially in the age of live streaming, where more often than not, we're putting on shows for other people while we play. This is beautiful. Hang on, hang on. There you go. Maybe it's already starting. There's an $100,000 Kickstarter project for a bear simulator game that looks equally amazing. So what do you think? Is Goat Simulator totally revolutionary or just a complete glitchy mess? Oh, I know someone who would have a good answer for that. Tim, Tim Schaefer. Uh, I don't know. Well, there you have it. Hash it out in the comments, and if you like what you saw, please subscribe. We taped a great interview with Tim and I about comedy and games, which we'll link to in the description, and I will see you all next week. Last week we talked about whether or not the FPS was dying or just evolving. Let's see what you have to say. Nico Kuhn says that the Oculus Rift and virtual reality are going to change FPSs forever. I totally agree, and I reflected on some of that in my previous episode about the Oculus Rift. I do think a lot of the expectations that we have about how we play a shooter game are not going to carry over into virtual reality for the simple reason that it's going to make you nauseous and sick. So I do think it will open the possibility for some of these maybe more experimental games that maybe wouldn't necessarily attract core gamers who like Call of Duty, but might actually like these kind of like experimental experimental, broody, ambient, atmospheric type games in virtual reality. Gaston says that the real problem is the military theme. And yeah, I think that that's probably true, but I think a big piece of that is just like shooting and killing other people over and over and over again. I think that that's a big part of the fatigue. So it could be a military, it could be outer space, it could be wherever. I just think the idea of like just using the FPS as a vehicle to kill Nazis or whatever it might be, that's where I think the problem lies. Mr. Devin 712 has a different critique of the FPS genre, specifically that they are not realistic enough, that the weapons aren't realistic enough. I think you should actually take that a little bit further. Do you think maybe it's that the depiction of war isn't realistic enough? I mean, Clint Hawking, the one of the lead designers for games like Far Cry 2, had said that um, why isn't Call of Duty about duty? Why isn't Medal of Honor about honor? So I think if you're looking for realism in terms of the number of bullets that are in a particular magazine, then you should also be looking for emotional reality that reflects um, what it's like to be at war. 
Jordan Strand believes that sort of a classic FPS won't go away. And I think that you're probably right, whether that's like Call of Duty or Battlefield or whatever, there's probably room in the market for a single one that everybody really understands. You know, it's really interesting. In order for an Olympic sport to go before the IOC, in order for it to be approved an Olympic sport, there has to be a single rule set and a single international organizing body that governs all of its rules. Something similar might happen with like the military FPS where there's just like one, and that's what's played at a professional level. So yeah, very astute point. Jerry Pendleton doesn't agree that Portal and Unfinished Swan should be labeled as FPSs because they rely more on puzzles. Um, I don't know, I think mean, it's just a difference of opinion. I mean, kind of laid out my case for why I don't necessarily think it's just puzzles, but also the fact that you're having a particular interaction with an object in space, and that's what the defining characteristic is. But hey, we can disagree. But Jerry does make a very different point, which is that he doesn't like necessarily that games are placed in the genres based on their mechanics like RPGs or shmups or whatever it might be. I think that's a really good point. I don't know if we're gonna move more towards a place like film. Um, Jerry wants uh, games to be categorized according to their emotional resonance, right? So in film, we have comedies, romantic comedies, we have action movies, all different types. I don't know necessarily that it's gonna be quite as amorphous as film, but I don't think that we should necessarily be quite as structured as the categories that we have right now. I mean, new mediums require new ways to talk about them, new ways to think about them. I'm certainly excited for, um, for new classifications for games and shedding the way, um, shedding the old ones that we had.